quick thing on the web animations API, which is not new, but it's sort of getting some, some traction. It's um, basically the JavaScript way of accessing CSS animation properties. I've said a few times on, on the videos about CSS animations, that the whole bulk of practical real world examples are probably going to be very small, subtle things, the hover effects, making something active, setting a background color, setting a uh, an opacity fade or of a slight um, growing shrink, something just to show that you've kind of something selected or something that's being hovered over. Anything beyond that is usually some sort of fancy bespoke thing, um, like a big uh, logo that's going to jump and spin or something that's going to kind of fade in and do something quite impressive. But it's quite um, quite specific, quite select. And part of the reason for that might be that. Come on. Part of the reason for that might be that there's a kind of limitation on, on where you can get to. You can only really go so far in terms of CSS properties and that you can affect what's visually in front of you. You can make properties change in CSS without the ability to tap into any DOM level events or any outside the browser inter interactions. You, you're you going to quickly run into some limitations. Let's have a quick look. There's um, this fantastic... Uh, Quite large section. Dan Wilson has has gone through some details. We kind of just copy his uh, some code. Got some JavaScript here. What's this doing? Power player get element to animate. There's our div. Um, let's do width to fifty, height to fifty. Uh, just give it a black background. What does this do? Okay, cool, that works. So let's just run through some code. So we've got this this bouncing animations. You find your element called dot animate, and then you pass a series of objects where you set the um, the offset. It looks like that's the point in the animation, and then these are just CSS properties passed in a in a JavaScript format, right? And then there's a second block which is your options, the duration, the easing, delay, iterations. This is incredibly familiar to people that have done CSS animations. This is the same thing you would set. You do a keyframe where you set different percentages and points for things to happen. And then you can set duration and easing and delay and so on. It's it's identical, probably by design, that you can create a CSS and you can create a CSS animation here with this uh, API, or you can just write one natively in CSS. Which would beg the question of like, well, what what is the benefit? What is the strength of of Doing one via JavaScript is this just a obsession with JavaScriptifying everything that's the CSS based? Yeah, again, it comes back to what things you get out the box and what things are going to add additional benefits. Hmm. Okay, so here's a, here's a slightly more complex example. I've got this article which is just off the Guardian, uh, Maradona, and I've got the image on the right. And then as you scroll at certain points, it's going to trigger a transition change. It's going to fade in a new image and also set the background uh, to, to have the images as an overlay. Um, so there's a few things going on here. You've got to know your images. You've got to uh, have those set in two different places, which is fairly straightforward with a, uh, a, a CSS variable. You'd also need to have that transition method between the two and you would need to know the triggers at certain points. So I guess there's a, there's a few things. If you were approached with this idea to do it entirely in CSS animations, you would uh, probably struggle. Firstly, you would need to have all 10 images known and set up, so you couldn't just pull them from an API dynamically. You would have to have them all loaded on the page because you can't lazy load you know, just out the box of CSS. You would have to uh, position them all ready to animate at certain points and then set certain triggers and then possibly use some sort of scroll position it would be very difficult to do just with CSS alone however uh, usually at this point you would say you're going to need to use some library either like a green sock like a big animation library or maybe you'll find some JS library that just does a scroll based event something that's going to enable you to trigger animations at certain points uh, instead this is the way we solved it. So you, I've, I've just locally made a list of all the image URLs. Then I've got my transition method, which is going to find the main image and the next image, and then call animations on them. 
uh, pretty much the exact same syntax. So basically I've got my main image and then the one that's waiting in the wings on a zero opacity. And the transition is just this main one is going to fade out and this one is going to do the opposite. It's going to fade in and they happen at the same time. And at that point, this one will reset, will change its ID to go over here. And then this becomes the next image. And then you can set the source so it can preload the next image. And then when you click the next button, we get the next transition. So you really only have two tiles. They're going to be able to just keep uh, rolling between them. So down here we see, uh, do your translate, do your rotation, do your fan fancy kind of slide out, change your opacity. Uh, just worth noting the animation can be obviously set as a, as a uh, JavaScript variable so we can save those values is another benefit of the JavaScript then I can call a dot finished so again rather than uh, a CSS animation where you just kind of set a time on those animations and you just have to hope that they both trigger around the same time and hopefully they both finish at the same time here you can very specifically put a promise on there to say when this is finished executing then we can do all our cleanup stuff afterwards uh, so we are going to change the, this main image to be the next and the next to be the main and we load up the next image in that array. And here on the next one we'll do a similar transition that's then afterwards going to switch to be the main. It's not the cleanest way of doing it but it kind of demonstrates the point I'm trying to make. And then I've got a basic uh, flag to stop it being triggered multiple times and here we just set the background to also be that uh, URL image. Um, yeah, just as the full explanation for this, there's then um, a data attribute and we're using the interaction observer, intersection observer, which is just then going to know when it passes an image to, to load up this particular image when it comes into view. So there's a whole bunch of JavaScript going on there you're, you're dealing with. Uh, logging when elements are visible and not visible on the page, meaning you can only, only preload the image when you need to, uh, which has performance benefits. You've got... Um, this chaining of events, the fact you can set two animations to happen in parallel, the fact you can use variables to save values and share those across those animations. There's there's a whole bunch of extra leverage you obviously get from just using a programming language, language like JavaScript. You can enhance these extra things. You can pull in things such as remote data. You can be aware of the, the DOM and the, the page heights and widths and so on. So really it's it's sort of saying... CSS animations do have a, a real limitation that you run into quite quickly and that you can do all kinds of incredible visual things, but anything that's even slightly dynamic or needs some sort of user event uh, makes it not really viable. So here you're leveraging the exact same technology to say, let's use CSS animations, but via a JavaScript API, which means we can also embed some extra features. And that's um, quite a fantastic uh, strength there. <laughs> I suppose if there's a, a, a downside to this, it's just that you are now starting to spread that language into two places. So you might have um, set your transition delay property or transition uh, setting on an element, and then you've also set an animation on that element in another place. You're now changing the element's visual effects, both in the CSS and the JavaScript, and you're starting to kind of muddy those waters. You wouldn't then want to just put loads of CSS in your JavaScript just for the sake of keeping that in one place, but then you need to do it sometimes, um, and it's not always ideal. So it would kind of be for a specific use case where you're going to get to leverage those JavaScript features. Um, and I guess that could make it harder to debug or, or find solutions because you're not sure which things are being set by the CSS and what by the JavaScript. But um, if you're not, you're... Um, but if you know what's within the scope of the thing you're trying to achieve, I guess that can be avoided. Anyway, yeah, JavaScript uh, Web Animations API, though, it's um, really handy for lots of situations. If you the animation you want is uh, slightly complex, but you don't want to go the full green sock route of being, bringing a big library to do so, um, a really good option. Let me know what you think if you've used it, um, and, you know, have a good day. <laughs> They're up.